Hello, juniors. Good to see you again. It's Friday already. Can you believe it? Have you been having a good time at camp meeting? Yeah, me too. It's great. Well, I'm wondering how many of you enjoy school? Yes. Good. Okay. Let me ask another question. And I know not everybody can go to a Seventh-day Adventist school for one reason or another. But if you do go to a Seventh-day Adventist school, do you know how your school got started? Yes? I see some, I, I see two girls here. Okay, tell me, how did your school get started? Nice and loud. That's okay. Okay, what about you? How did your school get started? You're homeschooled. You were homeschooled, and your mom was homeschooled. Well, you know what? That is not a new idea. In fact, that is the very beginnings of the Seventh-day Adventist educational system, the Seventh-day Adventist schools. It started out with the idea of homeschooling. How about that? So we're going to peek in at some of those early pioneer parents as they're talking about what are they going to do with their children. <clears throat> well, it is true that our children need an education so they can grow up to be good citizens and so they can make a living for themselves. True, but where can they study where they will not be considered strange, odd, or be made fun of because of their peculiar beliefs? And and where, where can they receive a constant godly influence from teachers who understand the three angels' message? You brought up some important points. Things that we really need to consider and think about. Oh, I know what we can do. We can band together and form some sort of homeschool cooperative. Our children could gather together in one of our homes, and then one of us could teach them. Or we could even hire a tutor. That's a wonderful idea. Yeah, I think that might work. I, I could do some teaching. I can too. So the homeschool idea worked for a while, but it was just private, meaning it was just parents banding together, seeing what they could do to teach their children. It wasn't quite a church school yet. At this time, James and Ellen White, they were also thinking about educating children, what could be done, and they started writing about it, thinking and praying about it, and in early 1858, James White announced that there was going to be a school at Battle Creek. And it was going to be opening 
And not only could the children of Battle Creek come to this school, but he invited others, other children from outside of Battle Creek to come too. And John Byington was going to be the teacher. Well, the school started, but it didn't last very long, only a few months. It just didn't work out, sadly. But some years later, in 1867, something happened that was the beginning of the first Seventh-day Adventist, the first official Seventh-day Adventist school. Let's see what happened. I first came to Battle Creek as a patient in Dr. Kellogg's world-famous Western Reform Health Institute, the sanitarium. I wasn't feeling very well. You see, I used to go to the Oberlin College where I was learning lots of wonderful information and then my father died when I was 19 years old. And so I had to go to work. And I started teaching. And I taught and was doing a good job. And more and more people came to my schools. And I couldn't say no. And I just was teaching more and more and more. And I got so busy and so worn out that I finally fell ill when I was 34 years of age. And I came to the Health Institute See, I'd always been a Christian my whole life. I was a Baptist, and then I became a Disciples of Christ. And while I was at the sanitarium at the Health Institute, my roommate was a Seventh-day Adventist, and I didn't know much about Seventh-day Adventists, and I thought, hmm, are they kind of a strange people? But my roommate was so nice, and I started studying the Bible, and after a while, I realized that the Adventists had the truth, and I became a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, Dr. Kellogg prescribed something very interesting for Mr. Bell. He didn't give him a pill. He didn't give him a shot. I'm sure he was happy about that. He prescribed physical exercise and work especially outdoors, that that would help Mr. Bell get better. And so he was given an important but pretty heavy job, and that was chopping wood for the boilers for the Review and Herald. So he worked for the Review and Herald chopping wood. Mr. Bell. How are you doing? <laughs> hey, I'm doing really good, Edson. I'm doing really good. I'm just, you know, Dr. Kellogg said that <clears throat> we should get outside and get some fresh air and some exercise, and so I'm just outside. Boy, I remember those days when I was a teacher. Boy, I'd be in that classroom hours upon hours a day, and it would be dark because the windows were closed and the stove was was burning, and I, I could barely breathe in there. It's not hard to breathe out here, is it? Not at all. Mr. Bell, did yeah. you say you were a teacher? Yes, I did. Hmm, I was wondering. I kind of had some hard times in school, especially in grammar and writing. Now, I wish I kind of learned it a little better. Well, you know, Edson, there's no way to learn better than to get some good reading material in your hands. Something like the Adventist Review. That's right. Um, I'm wondering, do you think you can maybe help me and some of my friends with writing or grammar? Because I really appreciate it, and I think some of them would be grateful, too. 
you know, Edson, let me work on that. I think there's something we could do about that. Thank you. And that was the beginning of Mr. Bell's night school. He started teaching Edson and some of his friends grammar and writing, and they really liked him because Mr. Bell was an excellent teacher. Well, word got around again. Mr. Bell, did you know, not only can he chop wood, he's a really good teacher too. And so, the parents at Battle Creek, they wanted Mr. Bell to teach their children. So they tried getting a school started again, but it didn't last very long. There wasn't a lot of money to keep the school going. And you know to have a church school, it takes quite a bit of money. So it didn't work out. But Mr. Bell kept teaching students one-on-one -on, -one on an individual basis. He also worked on a magazine called The Youth's Instructor. Uh, it's now called Insight Magazine, but it was for young people, and he also worked in Sabbath school. He was such a good teacher. He helped develop a Sabbath school teaching program, and he would go around to where all the Adventist churches were and show them how to have a good Sabbath school program so that the students could really learn. Well, very important, in 1872, what year did I say? 1872. Good. You know what happened in 1872? Ellen White had a vision about education and what Adventist education ought to look like. And she wrote out that vision, and we're going to hear her and see what she saw in the vision as she writes. Glory, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Lord, we need a school. We need a school where those who, are, who just want to teach and preach can learn. Oh, yes, Lord. And, and in the common branches of education where they may learn more perfectly the truths of God's word. Yes. Let me dip my pen in that ink again. In connection with these schools, lectures must be given on, on Revelation and Daniel. Yes, and teachers should not try to control the mind and, of students, but they need to guide their students and respect and follow the counsel and learn to act on principle and reason. Glory, glory. Teachers are to come close to their students and personally connect with them like a relationship, Lord. Is that what you mean? Yes. Helping them to see that they love their students and love. Yes, Lord. Love is what motivates their actions and their influences, and it defines their students. Oh, Lord, did you say classrooms ought to be spacious and big and, and windows that can be raised? Yes, Lord, you've got it right. And need to be educated regarding, oh, you mean, Lord, they need to brush their teeth and take a shower? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory, glory. Oh, this is wonderful. Education needs to continue to combine study and physical labor? Oh, Lord, you're so correct. Yes, they need to be taught how to, how to plant tomato plants. Yes. And, and to drive a car. Oh, yes. and, and also, Lord, 
you said uh, boys and girls, even boys, need to learn how to sew? No. Oh. Wow. Glory, glory, glory. That was a pretty important vision, wasn't it? It was like God gave her a blueprint. You know, when you build a house or any building, you need a blueprint, don't you? And it shows exactly how to build it. Well, that's what God gave Ellen White, how to have a Seventh-day Adventist school. He gave her a blueprint. Well, that year, the people at Battle Creek, the Battle Creek Church, as well as people from the General Conference, it was all kind of at Battle Creek at that time, they got together and they talked seriously and they looked at the blueprint that Mrs. White had written out and they saw that one of the main goals of Adventist education was to prepare students to be workers for God. Amen. Did you know that? And they were to focus on character building. That means to be the kind of people that Jesus wants us to be, to be loving and kind and thoughtful and hardworking and loyal and true to him, to be spiritual, to understand the importance of prayer and reading the Bible and service, helping other people. Well, by mid-May of 1872, the General Conference had assumed financial responsibilities. That means they would help pay for it. The Battle Creek Church, it didn't all rest on their shoulders. The General Conference was going to help them, and that made it our first denominationally sponsored Seventh-day Adventist school. That means it was our first Seventh-day Adventist church school. And they hired Mr. Bell to be the teacher. So let's see Mr. Bell and his students. Good morning, students. Good morning, Mr. Bell. How are you all doing today? Do you know that you are sitting in the very first school of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Isn't that exciting? Now, in this school, we are going to learn all kinds of exciting things. We are going to learn how to write. We're going to learn how to figure. We're going to learn how to read. We're going to learn all kinds of wonderful things. But you know what's special about this school? We are going to learn about God. This school exists so that you can learn about God. You can be in a safe family atmosphere. And you can be trained up on how to serve God in the world, no matter what it is that you do. Are you ready? Pick up your chalk boards and your chalk, 
and let's get ready to learn. And that was the very beginning of Adventist education. God blessed Adventist education. And did you know that there are thousands of elementary schools, Seventh-day Adventist elementary schools, all over the world? And not only that, there are academies all over the world. There are colleges all over the world. There are universities all over the world. And there are even Seventh-day Adventist medical schools where people can become doctors and be missionaries. And dental schools where they can become dentists and missionaries. And nurses and teachers. And we have all kinds of training available. So I hope that you can also enjoy Adventist education and that you can appreciate it a little bit more now that you see how it started and how God directed this church through Mrs. White to know just what kind of education that we needed. So this is the end of our first presentation. You won't want to miss our next one coming up in just a few minutes. We're going to have a change of set, and we are going to learn more about Edson White. So we're going to have a change of set right now. And while the people do that, let's, uh, let's have a little short quiz since we're talking about education. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, all this. This is going to be easy peasy. Easy peasy. Okay. Okay. Raise your hand if you shout it out. I won't call. Raise your hand. What was Mrs. White's maiden name, the name before she got married. Yes. What's that? Hammond? No. Okay. Harmon. You were close. That's right. Ellen Harmon. Okay. Here's one a little bit harder. Does anyone remember the name of her brother when they went to see? Okay. Robert. Very good. Okay, I'll look for someone over here this time. Who can tell me how did James and Ellen White meet? Okay. Uh, no, right there, you're, I'm looking at you, yeah. Nice and loud. Oh, that's right. She was with some friends and a, with a horse and a sleigh. And remember, a sleigh is kind of like this carriage, but instead of the wheels, it has almost like ice skates on it. It's pretty cool. And so she was riding with the friends to this place, and she met the owner of that horse and sleigh, who happened to be James White. Um, Mr. Bell would like to say a couple words to all you students, if you would pay attention. Hi, boys and girls. I had so much fun playing Good Little Bell, and I also have a lot of fun in real life being the superintendent of education for the Michigan Conference. So our school system, which started in 1872 with this classroom that you just saw portrayed, our school system is still alive and well and thriving. Do you know how many schools we have in Michigan? We have 35 schools all across the state from Detroit all the way up into the Upper Peninsula. So if you have any questions about education, you want to be a part of Adventist education and our mission, we've got a booth over in the tent right over there. Today we were actually giving away freezer pops too. So 
Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you very much. Okay, I think, are we ready? We are ready for our next play, but one more quiz question. Remember, raise your hand. What was the name of James and Ellen White's first son? You. What? Henry. Okay, now I'm gonna ask this section, I'll ask each section. This section, how old was Henry when he died? Okay. 17 or 16? 16. Okay, let's ask you, what was the name of Ellen White's second son? Not Henry, in the back there. Yeah, you. Huh? No, his second son. Remember the three boys marching in? Okay. Yes. Edson, but it's a little bit tricky. Edson was his middle name. For extra credit for anyone, do you know Edson's first name? Oh. No. Nope, nope. Oh, close, he said John. James, his full name was James Edson White, but he went by James. Okay, for this section over here, what was the name of the White's fourth son? John Herbert, and he was a baby when he died. Okay, so this story is about Edson and we're going to see what happened to him a few years later. This is a few years after he talked to Mr. Bell. Oh, yes, they're here, the painter was right. This is exactly what I was looking for. This is the letter. The letter that my mother wrote the leaders. The leaders of the Battle Creek Tabernacle. This is perfect. It was an appeal letter to them. And this is just what I need to read. It says, March 21, 1891. Our duty to the colored people. White men and white women should be qualifying themselves to work among the colored people. Christians will not, cannot live in luxury and self-indulgence while there are suffering ones around them. They cannot, by their practice, sanction any phase of oppression or injustice to the least child of humanity. The black man's name is written in the book of life beside the white man's. All are one in Christ. Birth, station, nationality, or color cannot elevate or degrade men. The character makes the man. Those who slight a brother because of his color are slighting Christ. This is it. I've got to go tell Will. Will Palmer. What about you? Man, my mother has written me another letter. It's 10 pages long. I, I, I feel like just throwing it into the fire sometimes. I feel like I should do that again, and, but maybe I'll read it this time. Oh. Dear son Edson, Edson, please read this carefully. Do not cast it aside or burn it. What? This is June 21, 1893 from New Zealand. 
Why should you express yourself as you have done? Why use such firm language? Why do you have any satisfaction in this selfish independence? You have had light shining all around you, but refuse to walk in the light. Your soul is in peril. We have had soul agony and sent up our prayers to God with many tears. I awoke quarter past one o'clock full of terror. I had a scene pre presented before me. You and four other young men were upon the beach. You all seemed too careless, unconcerned, yet in great danger. Many had collected on the beach to observe your moments, and this seemed to make you more determined and venturesome. The waves were rolling up nearer and still nearer, and then would roll back into a sullen roar. Gestures and warnings were given by the anxious ones looking on, but in answer to all their warnings, you were more presumptuous. Someone placed his hand on my shoulder. Did you know that is your son, Edson? You cannot hear your, he cannot hear your voice, but he can see your motions. Tell him to come at once. He will not disobey his mother. I reached out my hands. I did all I could do to warn. I cried with all my power of voice. You have not a moment to lose. The undertow, the undertow. I knew that once you were in the power of the treacherous undertow, no human power could avail. A strong rope was brought and fastened securely around the body of a strong man, young man who ventured to risk his own life to save you. You seemed to be making light of the whole performance. I saw the merciless undertow embrace you, and you were battling with the waves. I awoke as I heard a fearful shriek from you. I prayed most earnestly in your behalf and arose and am writing these lines. Mrs. White knew how powerful an undertow can be. That's, you know, when the waves come in in the ocean and you go out, and if you go out very far, if there's a bad undertow, it just sucks you right out to sea and you can't swim. Even if you're very strong, it's very, very hard to swim against the undertow. And in fact, she wrote about what it was like where she was, where someone, in fact, more than one, was killed by the undertow. She wrote, there was a young man, a strong young man. He checked into the hotel, and then he went out to the beach. No trace of him was ever found. His hat was washed ashore. They supposed he was ignorant of the treacherous undertow, and once in its embrace, there was no hope. Then she gave another example that she had read about. Four young men, experts in the water, who were caught in the undertow. After having their sport in the water, they attempted to reach the beach. But it required desperate energy, for the treacherous undertow would take them back. Many gathered on the beach to see them. The people were watching. What's going to happen with those boys? But the people were perfectly helpless to rescue them. They battled bravely for a long time. And then with a fearful, agonizing cry, they gave up the struggle. Only one was saved, and not by his own energies, for he gave up like the rest. But after being taken under by the undertow, a wave threw his supposedly lifeless body on the beach, and after some patient, lengthy efforts, he was restored to consciousness. What else did your mother say, Edson? I have since pondered on this representation almost constantly not at all religiously inclined. These are the words of Satan, not of my son. <sighs> the undertow. 
What does it represent? It represents the power of Satan and a set, independent, stubborn will of your own which has reached even against God. When I was observing your peril, I cannot express the feelings I passed through. It seemed that my soul would dissolve. I have not recovered from the impressions made on my mind as I cried to you, the undertow, the undertow. My son, I am deeply sorry for you. I would turn your course if I could, but you are, my, you are your own worst enemy, the course you have pursued toward your Savior, dishonoring him. It's grieving the Spirit of God and putting him to open course if I could shame before the enemies of truth and righteousness. It will require an effort to unbind yourself from Satan's chariot. Nevertheless, it is life or death with you. I could not have written you this letter, but I am exhorting you day and night, and I shall try to leave you now with God. I cannot save you. God alone can save you. But work while Jesus invites you in harmony with God. Mother. Oh, no. Juniors, did you notice what date that letter was written? Oh, very good, June 21. Who knows what today's date is? June 21. Isn't that something? On this very day, a long time ago, Ellen White wrote that letter. But maybe that letter wasn't just for Edson. Maybe that letter was also for someone else. Maybe that letter was also for somebody here, written today. Maybe you haven't said anything, but maybe in your heart you've said, I don't know about this religious stuff. When I get old enough and I don't have to do what my parents say, I'm not so sure I'm going to go to church anymore. Think about this letter and think about how God loves you and he wants you to belong to him. He wants you to be in heaven with him and give yourself to him if you haven't yet. Edson waited until he was 44 years old to come back to God. Those were wasted years, but at least after he came back to God, he did a wonderful work and now he's going to go talk to his friend Will Palmer. Remember, he saw the testimony of his mother. He picked him up off the floor. He read it, and he was so excited. He could help the people in the South who used to be slaves, and, and he could help them have an education. But how does he do that? Let's find out. Will, Will, you've got to see this, read this. Edson, this is amazing. We gotta do something. Somebody needs to help these people. These colored people, they need to learn to read and, and write too. And about God. We should do it. We should go and help them. Yes, you're right. We could build a steamboat. Think of it. We could have a floating church, a school, a printing press. 
We could print the books they need right on the boat. That's awesome. And you know, we could travel down the river and we could, you know, have schools on the boat, have them come on and we could teach them about God and then, you know, build churches and stuff while we're going down. I love it. This is great. I am so excited. We've got to tell our wives. Yeah, they that's, are going to be super yeah, excited too. Yeah, for Let's sure. Go. Let's go. Let's go. And that's exactly what they did. And their wives were excited. They wanted to help too. And so they built a steamship for the river and they called it the Morning Star. This is what it looked like. But you know, it was dangerous work to go down south with their river boat because it wasn't that long after the Civil War and it wasn't that long after their, the, the people, the black people were slaves. And there were mean people who did not want them to have an education. They didn't want them to have schools. In fact, if someone would build a school for the black people, somebody would come and burn it down. And in fact, when Edson and Will and their friends went down to help, one of the friends, he was almost lynched. That means a mob came after him, chasing him. They were going to kill him. Another person was beaten with a whip, all because they wanted to help the African Americans to have an education and to have churches. But they kept on anyway with the Morning Star. And they went from place to place. They would invite people on. They had at schools. And they would also, in each place, they would build a school and a church. And many, many African Americans were educated this way because of Edson White and his friends on the Morning Star. Well, Edson also wrote a book. And it was called The Gospel Primer. He wrote it to help teach reading and also to help the students to learn about God and about the Bible. And this book sold thousands of copies. And it also helped raise funds for them to use on the Morning Star. Well, Will and Edson, we're going to see them again and see what they have to tell us next about the Morning Star. Well, Edson, you know, God has really been blessed in the old Morning Star. I mean, it's amazing to think of what we and our families have been able to do and how many, I mean, how many kids and young people have learned about God in the Bible through our work on the Morning Star. Yes, by God's grace, we've been able to set up so many schools along the South for all of our colored brothers and sisters. It's been such a blessing. It's been amazing. And think of all the church buildings and school buildings that we've left behind that when we move on to another town, I mean, think those people are still there worshiping God in their churches. I mean, it's cool. Amazing. Yeah. You know what? We've had some trials and some struggles. We've had some hard times. You Woo! All those. You're not just a kidding. Woo! But you know what? God has seen us through. He and has. And he got us to be able to finish that work down there of what he's given us. And you know what? Maybe that's just what being a missionary is all about. Yeah, that's right. Man, thanks so much for stopping by my house and getting us started on this thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Morning Star finished its work in 1904. It wasn't really needed anymore because there were so many schools and churches that had been built. Sadly, the next year it sank. But Edson have it, had it pulled up out of the river. But the next year it burned to the ground, but fortunately, you see there was a star right there between the two smokestacks. The star survived. And today, 
That star is in one of our Seventh-day Adventist colleges, actually university now. How many of you have heard of Oakwood University? That's right. And if you were ever to go to Oakwood, you could still see today the star that was on the Morning Star ship. And that's how God blessed education in setting up our first school and then a unique role for education 